listening to Rock and Roll Grad School with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. Consider yourselves officially enrolled. Hello, kiddies. We're going to have a real good time together. This is a Y episode we are re-airing. We are pairing this one with Mark Farner because we talked with another Michigander, mm-hmm. someone who you were very, very excited to talk to. Very excited. Because first of all, and that would be... I'm furthering the, the, my philosophy and theory that all great music really does come from Detroit or have some sort of tie-in to the Great Lakes state. Mm. And so far on both okay. shows, odds have been in my favor that this has That's some true. legs to it. That's and yes, true. this particular individual is the one and only Susie Quattro. Leather Tuscadero herself. Leather Tuscadero herself. And also for anyone who has spent any time really listening or reading any rock bios or, you know, discovering the the history of of rock from the 60s, 70s and beyond, you will be hard pressed to find someone that does not credit Susie Quattro with influencing them in some way, shape or form. And her friends such as Debbie Harry will attest to that. Mm -hmm. I talked to her to promote a film about her called Suzy Q. It's it's a lovely documentary and she just released a new record. So they already need to redo the documentary now. Yes. But the film is one of those projects where you look at all the people they interviewed to talk about her influence. And it's a super impressive list. I mean, any list that has Debbie Harry on it right there, it's going to be impressive. Yes. Well, and she also threw her, Tina Weymouth is in there with Chris Franz and Mm -hmm. the documentary led us to Chris indirectly, friend of the show. Um, And yeah, it's fantastic. She's fantastic. She's everything you want her to be. This is, I don't even know who posted this. Do you remember? I know. Yes. I, I actually found it on our friend Chris Franz's Facebook page and sent it to you from okay. there. It is dated uh, June 30th, 1971. Yes. Uh, addressed to a Mr. B. Ferry. Mm-hmm. And it is from records. Uh, so this uh, thanks him for sending in their demonstration tape of, of the, quote, Roxy Music Group. We are unanimous that the group sounds like no other modern act we have heard. However, we feel that Roxy Music does not quite merit a contract with a record company as prestigious and globally important as Polydor. So, I mean, it's impressive. What I like to do in reading this was imagining Brian Ferry Is it Ray Manzara, I believe, and Brian Eno sitting around a table reading this to each other? Right. Well, and it just gets better from there. I mean, they just really send a very lovely letter to them. You mean where they say the main instruments seem competently played, but the songwriting sometimes lacks the focus set uh, the songwriting sometimes lacks the focus, which a more conventional structure would provide. The electric sounds are, quote, interesting, but fall short of the musicality of Walter Carlos, for example. Uh, the lyrics sound promising in places, but the lead vocals, which isn't the one thing that's like one of the many things that really makes Rocky, Roxy music great, is the lead vocals of Brian Ferry sounding- A thousand percent. <laughs> completely bored with everything yes they say uh the describe the lead lead vocals uh, quote in the words of one respected member of my department tends to put one in the mind of quote frankie vaughn locked in a haunted house i don't think i know who frankie vaughn is i don't think i don't think that's a compliment i don't think it is either but perhaps it is if we knew who frankie vaughn is can i read the last paragraph because it's my favorite part Please do. That would please do. (laughs) So I hope these minor criticisms prove useful. To reward your interest in the company, I enclose a complimentary cassette 
of James Last's latest hit album for Polydor, Polka Party. And then so yours sincerely. I, I, don't, I don't know what's funnier. Uh, the minor criticisms being like completely reform your band and rewrite all your songs. Right. Um, one complimentary cassette of copy right. of the cassette of James Last's and Polka Party. And it's a cassette, mind you. Right. So on top of everything else, they have to split custody of this cassette right. of Polka Party. <laughs> of Polka Party. <laughs> and it's... It, it's amazing. Yeah. And obviously, the, the, one of the reasons, the reason why Chris shared it and one of the things that's fantastic about it is when you see like, oh, how wrong you were there, Mr. Smith. But right. it's also very lovely to be in a position like ours where we're doing something that often is said to be not normal enough or not in the box enough to see Thank that perhaps right. we are the Brian Ferries of the podcast world. If only we could be the Brian Ferries of well, the podcast world. Time. I know. We're not, uh, there's not enough on we, I think, is yeah. that's what we're missing. That may be. That's true. Um, well, I'm going to dig up James Last's record, Polka Party. <laughs> right. And send you a copy, and then we can trade it back and forth. Yes, you have to set it on cassette, though. I want to of look up, up and see if uh, Mr. Vaughn has gotten out of that haunted house yet or if he's still stuck there. <laughs> perhaps we should speak to him for our other show. I, and there is something great. I mean, I, I, the Beatles rejections from all the other labels yes. in the UK, uh, except for Parlophone, they were never that vicious. No, this and is And yet horrific. that letter as... As nasty as it is, it is so English on top of everything else. It is. It is. It's like they're trying to have sort of an English off to be like, who can be more English? This band that sounds completely lackadaisical and uninterested in playing or the record label who thinks very high of a, highly of themselves, but still not highly enough to open their boundaries a little bit. Right. So Frankie Vaughn was apparently yes, an please. English singer and actor who recorded more than 80 easy listening and traditional pop songs in his lifetime. He was known as Mr. Moonlight after one of his early hits. And two of his singles topped the UK singles chart, The Garden of Eden and The Tower of Strength. Mm. See, I feel like Frankie Vaughn in a haunted house is like, you put that on the poster. Right? You know, like, okay, okay, I want to hear that. Right. I mean, here he is coming off a. Oh, look at him. Well, right. He's, yeah. Well, he's, he's very on dashing. The jet way there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that flight Women attendant looks flowers. happy. Right. He looks so, thrilled. Yeah. I know. And we love a good, easy listening. I mean, don't oh, get please. me wrong. No, I, I don't have it up yet. Uh, I, in my record albums behind me, I have somewhere a copy of my grandfather's uh, copy of the Sing Along with Our Roses Society, mm. which I love this album. So uh, it was a, I believe it was a whiskey, The Four Roses. Yes. And if you sent away enough uh, box stops or whatever, they okay. sent you this record. And the album, it features a of the 50s guys and gals just sitting around drinking there's a dog who's singing along with them and so what you do with this record is you put it on all the lyrics are on the back of the album you get wasted and then you sing along with the people on the record and it's like you have friends over oh that's the best idea ever we have to make an album like that i know do you include know. your dog in this sing along like a captain yeah. sing along i guess he could i mean it's it's as um manufactured as that beach boys party album yes or even tom Hulley's nighthawks at the diner similarly sort of like is this a party what if it's not too well it's all a party if you want but to. we need to get some uh that's true we need to get some uh 
I want to say Robert Vaughn. That's not, he's the guy from Frankie. 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 Lionel Vaughn, is that right? Frankie Vaughn. Frankie. Not to be confused with we Frankie need, Avalon. We need to get some, right. We well, need they to seem get some Frankie similar. Vaughn records. We do. Is Frankie's? is he still alive? Frankie Vaughn is not still alive. Oh, my God. He died bless. in 99. Um, oh, we were not that close to getting him on the show. No, it doesn't hurt as much when there was never a chance. Yes, but, oh, and James Last is also no longer with us. Uh, he was German. Oh, Frankie has his and, CBE. Yes. Oh, well, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, <clears throat> uh, James Last, whose real name was Hans Last, uh, his composition Happy Heart was an international success oh. uh, as recorded by Andy Williams and Petula Clark. Oh. Yeah. He, uh, his final UK performance was his 90th birthday celebration at Royal, uh, Royal Albert Hall. And he had more performances at Royal Albert Hall, except for Eric Clapton. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. And he was known as either the king of elevator music, music or acoustic porridge. So, oh. you know, you can't win them all is no, what I think we can take from that. True. But acoustic porridge is kind of a great phrase and would be a phenomenal mm -hmm. band name, by the way. That is very true. Mm -hmm. So let's see here. I'm looking at his discography, which is insane. And uh, I'm looking. Okay. So 1971, he released, oh, uh, goodness. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven albums in 1971 alone. Ooh. And we can just go down to these, go down these quickly, and, and then you can listen to Susie and we'll we'll go away. Uh, one has a German name that I'm not going to pronounce. We'll have to get Rachel on, but it's volume two. Oh. Uh, in yep, in Scandinavia. Oh, my it's, country. Uh, people. Number two. Okay. Yep. I believe it's pronounced happy ending, H-A-P-P-Y-N-I-N-G. Maybe that's okay. also German. Mm. Nonstop Dancing 12. Whoa. There were 11 volumes of Nonstop Dancing prior to. Whew. The aforementioned Polka Party in concert. Okay. Hopefully a polka concert. Uh, music from Across the Way. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know, but that is probably the biggest catch-all album title of all time. And I think we should also <laughs> I know. utilize that for our upcoming album. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last album from that year was Voodoo Party. Oh, see, that sounds a little spicier. Was, uh, What's well, like the uh, Rolling Stones album? Oh. Mm -hmm. It's not like a dead sort man's of. party. Hmm, maybe. And so in case you are wondering, which I bet you were, the non-snap dancing series went up to volume 20. Cool. And then after that, they just started putting the year on them. So there's non-stop dancing 76, 77, uh, 78, 79. Uh, let's see if we're not the nonstop dancing sound of the 80s. That was sort of a catch all. Mm -hmm. Nonstop dancing 81, nonstop dancing 82 hits around the world. I bet Morning Train by uh, Olivia Newton John, or I'm sorry, Sheena Easton's got to be on there, right? Oh, for sure, right? Yeah. And then let's see here nonstop dancing 83, Party Power. Ooh, that sounds Ooh. subversive. Nonstop dancing 85. It's kind of like the precursor to now that's what I call music. Yeah, but this is just one one guy, Hans right. Last. I'm sorry, James, James Last. Last. It's kind of like Liberace. Yeah, but did anyone ever call? I, I'm sure people called Liberace far worse than acoustic or porridge. True. But I think, so I think if we ever do a live show. Yes. As people are coming into the, the venue, 
<laughs> be it youth hostel or theater or Royal Albert know, Hall. I think we should play. Yeah, I think we should be playing nonstop dancing. Oh, completely. That should we should be playing nonstop so. dancing every time we enter a room. And if we're a guest on someone's show, Ooh. while we're waiting for them to mm. turn up, we should have nonstop dancing in the background. Like it's like it's our, you know, preview. Exactly. And so I, I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but if you go to our website at some point in the near future, we will have photos of the nonstop dancing covers because they are as good as you think they are, if not better than you think they are. And we'll leave it at that. So speaking of nonstop dancing, let's head down Devil Street Drive with mm -hmm. Susie Quattro. Movie about you. I had had that on my bucket list for a very long time. Um, I always wanted to tell my story and tell it properly. I always have gotten annoyed through the years that nobody's ever done the story right. They 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 make it bullshit. I'm the first one. Mm -hmm. You want a story? Here I am. I did it. I didn't have a blueprint. So I'm the one that can tell the story. So I've always wanted to just put the record straight. Tell you what it was like. You know, it wasn't always easy. I had, you know, hurdles to overcome and family problems and this and that. And I didn't make it right away. And so I wanted to show what it took for me to walk down the path of what I did. And nobody had done it before. So it's not like I had a blueprint that I could say, oh, that's what I want to do. That didn't exist. Right. So I just had to hold on tight to me. I had to hold on to who I was. And I'm pretty much like that now. I will not compromise for anybody. You had such foresight and strength and intuition and the ability to hold on who you are in a world to who you are in a world where nobody seems to hold on to who they are. How, how did you manage to do that? It's amazing. I think it was both. It's a double edged sword because, um, when you're one of five kids, you know, you, you are looking for your voice at, at any big family person would tell you that. And, I was kind of like the horse they didn't bet on, but I, I bet on me. I bet on me. I knew who I was and what I was capable of. I knew it from a tiny girl. And once I found my voice, I, I just wouldn't let it go. That's, that's my message. Mm -hmm. And when I got my, um, I'm jumping ahead of the story, but it seems to be important right here. When I uh, got my honorary doctor degree at Cambridge University, which is just surreal. <laughs> Don't even, I don't yeah. even have, I don't have a diploma. So I had a speech written here next to me and I looked at the sea of intellectuals. I'm going, how did I get here? And I just threw the, the speech aside and I found myself saying the following. Then I cried. I said, um, it doesn't matter. All you, I'm looking out at this sea of people. I said, uh, you know, it doesn't matter your, your color, your race, you know, male, female, doesn't matter. Each and every one of you, your job in life, you have a light. We all have a light. Go in there and find it. Switch it on. And let nobody ever switch it off. And then I cried. That's my message to the world. Find and your light. We've all got it. You know? Yeah. And it seems like that's sort of the mantra you've kind of lived by for your whole career. Did you have that feeling going to London by yourself, you know, yeah. coming out of Detroit. Yes, it was. Um, it was, you know, I, I was always waiting for the tap on the shoulder. I'm not going to lie about it. And uh, I've, I've talked about it with many other people. What other word can you call it? It's called X Factor. Let's just use that as an example. Right. OK, it's it's it, you know, you sound like you're bragging. I'm not. I'm just telling you what I knew I had. Mm hmm. You know, you and and anybody that has that goes, yeah, because you just know it. You know it from a tiny kid. Um, and if that was my calling card that was going to get me through life, then I better know it and I better use it. You know, so I just I just always knew that I was going to get come over here, going to get the tap on the shoulder. So it came, came twice in one week, and 
and the band that I was playing in, it was the first time for like 18 months out of nine years that I was in the background. And I only did a few songs a night and basically just played. So I got really good on my bass at that point. But, <laughs> but the two record companies within a week saw me. And both record companies didn't like the band. I was at the back. I came up to two songs from back. They both offered me a solo contract. So it's a no-brainer, isn't it, really? So when I, when I finally found out, which my family didn't tell me, as you saw in the film, they didn't tell right. me that they wanted me, which it, it, it's bad because, um, mind you, I would, I would have gone and, and made it anyway because that's my nature. You know, maybe it would have taken a bit longer, but somebody would have found me somewhere and I would have heard it. But I went and it was very sad leaving them. Yeah, it was. I was leaving everything I knew, my family, my band, you know, everything. But there was no way that I wasn't going to take this chance, you know. So I just sucked it up and was lonely and cried myself to sleep and did what I had to do to keep my voice my voice and I am the kind that will not compromise myself for anybody. I won't do it. I won't. Well, well then consequently you changed the world by honoring your voice. You opened up a pathway for so many other voices. I know. And it's, I, I was saying to somebody a little while ago, it, this is all hindsight because I didn't, I didn't do it thinking I'm going to do it for the girls. That, that wasn't even in my head. All I was doing was being me. And I didn't know this was happening until it happened. And then I went, Jesus Christ, what did I do? But <laughs> you know, as, as hindsight, you look back on it and, you know, you get people like Debbie Harry and Cherie Curry and Kathy Valentine. And Cherie gave me an award at the She Rock ceremony and she started to cry. And I just kind of went, and then I was doing an interview with Kathy, who also gave me an award in Texas and Cherie. And we're talking, and Kathy started to cry. And I'm going, then I had my friend from the Baby Alamos, uh, Susie DiMarchi. She came over, stayed over, went up to the ego room, and she started to cry. So when I look at these things now, what I realize is I think without meaning to, I gave permission for these women who didn't fit anywhere. And all of a sudden they had a place they belonged. And that's why they cry. I called out to them. I said, you can do this, you know, not knowing it just by being me. So that is a pretty wonderful thing to take to my grave when I go. Yeah. yeah. And did, did yeah. you have the feeling that you need needed to ask permission? You didn't, yeah. did you, who was your sort of the person you looked up to and said, I, if I could be like that person. I didn't ever ask any permission for anything in my life. Um, and I've been told by some of the toughest people in the business that nobody tells me what to do, but you can suggest. <laughs> <laughs> and don't I look guilty? That That is a guilt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. That makes me laugh because I know I am like that. I am like that. Um, I don't do gender. I never have. My hero was Elvis Presley from the time I was six. And I watched him on TV and I had the light bulb moment at that age. This is absolutely true. I went, I'm going to do that. And I knew it. So I just always, I knew I was different. I knew I didn't fit anywhere. That's the thing when, you know, if you don't fit anywhere, you got to find a place to fit. So I created my own niche. That's who I am. It's amazing. So I'm a, Lou's going to laugh Here at me. Here we go. <laughs> I grew up in Detroit. I'm in Detroit right now. When I was eight, I moved to London. And I grew up worshiping Leather Tuscadero. I worshipped you as Leather Tuscadero. I wanted to be you. I wanted everything, <laughs> inspired everything about it. When we moved to England, all of my friends worshipped you for all the amazing things you had done musically that here as your fellow Detroit hometown girl I hadn't experienced yet until no because a, a lot of you in America got acquainted with me through that show even though I'd been there doing lots of tours right. and lots of album era play it, right. re it really cemented from that show so in America I'm known as the girl who plays on the Tuscadero mm -hmm. everywhere else in the world they say 
weren't you on that show? What was it called? Happy Days? Right, right. <laughs> like, wait, you did that too? And but, it doesn't matter. Lava Tuscadero broke down the door and so did Susie Quattro. And guess what? We're the same person. Right. <laughs> but was it from the musical side of it, was it odd living across the world and having people back here not necessarily having experienced all the incredible things you were doing as they were happening, not discovering them until later or until other <laughs> people are saying how incredible you are. That had yeah. to be kind of surreal. It, it was, it was a little bit strange. I had to do a different set when I toured America. I started touring there in 74. So it wasn't filled with hits. It was filled with my albums, which is all my own stuff. Um, I just kept thinking, Oh, you're just taking time to catch on. You'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you'll get it. And they did. And now I'm in the happy position of America rediscovering me. So that's a nice thing to have at 70, isn't it? That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and that's the great thing about, yes, about the 70. film, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Building off of what Heidi was asking, what was Joni Cunningham like as a bandmate? Aaron. As a leader, I... let's say, band leader. <laughs> She, she was, she came in as a, one of the uh, suede's just for one episode. <laughs> she was a nice girl. You know, I liked her. She had some problems later on. Those problems were not evident when the show was going on. I think those problems came later when she didn't have that to hang on, you know? Mm -hmm. She was very involved in that. I'm very good friends with Ronnie still. I'm very good friends with Henry still. As you can see, he's in the film. Yeah. And in fact, Henry's, Henry's comment really gets me. I love what he says. And That's I love awesome. I love how he says it. He means oh, it. You can my, tell. Oh, yeah. My, my, my son pointed out to me that, um, as opposed to other documentaries, and I think you'll probably agree, everybody in this film is in there because they want to be in there, and they're speaking from their heart, and you really feel that genuine, don't you? That mm -hmm. genuine coming out. And it's so heartwarming, and it's so humbling. When I saw it on the big screen, I just cried the whole time, you know, because it's, well, you know, you think to yourself, geez, you know, like <laughs> Debbie Harry, she's a friend of mine. I, I wanted to do something that the director wouldn't let me do. I, I'm mad at him, but I suppose he's right. When Debbie says, when Debbie says in the film, Susie Quattro was so beautiful. I wanted my voice to come under it as a, <laughs> as a oh, God, Debbie. <laughs> Now, wouldn't it have been amusing? Yes. <laughs> but he said, no, let the compliment go. <laughs> you, know, you know, a lot of compliments you can take, you know, but I, I can't take Debbie Harry telling me. You know, sorry, what doesn't compute? Right. <laughs> well, it's it a lovely thing for her to say. I just, I really wanted to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, we would have let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Off, that's the, yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of shenanigans we've encouraged. <laughs> and you did a This Is Your Life on the BBC, and this film is essentially a This Is Your Life. I mean, you've had now twice the sort of Tom Sawyer version of getting to sit there and listen to everybody speak your praises. I mean, that's got to be really nice and fulfilling. And to see, you know, in 90 minutes... Here's your whole story, and here's the, the reach you had, like we were talking about earlier. It's amazing. It's amazing. That, that's what affects me when I watch it on the big screen. I just go, yay, 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 yay. You know, I have in my house an ego room, right? Everybody should have one. <laughs> and this, I've survived all this, and, and I'm very normal, as you can see. I'm a very normal person. Right. Um, yeah, I get, my, one of my friends went, eh. Yeah. <laughs> um, She's not here anymore, so eh, it's a you. Um, <laughs> I have to go up. This is how I handle my life. The ego room is on the top floor of my house. So you go up two flights of stairs. And on the third floor where it is, it's crooked. The wall, you can bang your head. It's an old 15th century house. So you have to be very careful to get to this ego room. And then you get there, and there's a very heavy wooden door. And I had a plaque made. And it says, ego room, mind your head. <laughs> and you go in, and it's full. On the table, you see the red book, This Is Your Life. So poignant. It's got clothes down one end, suits, you know, my lots of different jumpsuits, jacket from Happy Days, all the different clothes, three bases in the corner. 
videotapes off in order all the way around, CDs, DVDs, pictures in every single space available, stage things, scrapbooks, you know, the, what do you call them, the passes, everything. Mm -hmm. And you can go in there and sit there and you can enjoy everything Susie Quattro. And it's very quiet up there. It's the quietest room in the house, which is funny for an ego room. And then when you come out, the important part is for me, is I close the door. Yeah. And that's how I handle this business. I love it. That makes sense. I mean, I've heard stories of Neil Young going into his archives and being surrounded by every recording of Cortez the Killer and basically saying, I got to get out of here. This is creepy. I mean, it's similarly where it's like, I can visit, but I can't stay long. No, I can't stay long. No. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it, it, but it is a beautiful room. I love it up there. My granddaughter was helping me do it. She was about 12. My daughter was here. She helped me. And then she went home. My granddaughter stayed. And I was, I gave her the job of taping some pictures back into scrapbooks where the tape had worn off, you know? So she's mm -hmm. taping, taping, taping for about another hour. We had read it all day. And she turned to me and she said, grandma, I have to go downstairs. And I said, what's the matter? She said, I can't look at you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's great. What is that like being able to share such an amazing legacy with a granddaughter, with a grandchild of any gender? She loves it. Oh, she loves it. I When I go out with her, you know, I get stared at a lot because, I mean, I'm very known. So my face, even I had a mask on. I had a mask. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I had a mask on in the shop just yesterday. And I said something to somebody. She went, are you Susie Quattro? I said, you kidding me? Oh, my God. But it's cool to do that. She thinks I'm cool. When I try to, which I don't really do, but if I ever put a hat on or something like that, and I'll say, you know, this doesn't seem to be working, this little bit of a disguise. And she says to me, it never works, Grandma. You always look like you. And when you put something on, you look more like you. Because you look like you're hiding, you know, so <laughs> anymore. But it's fine. Um, if I had grown up with, um, it's it's good in a way. I didn't grow up at all looks identified. Not at all. Um, and imagine if I had. And then you get to that stage where you're a sex symbol and you're on everybody's walls. That must really mess with your head. Yeah. But because yeah. I didn't grow up that way. It's just like, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's thank you, but it, you know, you, you don't take it serious. You just don't take yeah. it serious. So in a way that saved me. Interesting. So what have you been up to recently with the, the lockdown? I know you were scheduled to play Detroit and, and do all, all this stuff. The gigs, all the gigs were canceled. So our first gigs now in the book are in September, which is horrible. That's really bad for the entertainment industry. I was yeah. supposed in Frisco to do the first film premiere that got canceled um, but now we're doing all the interviews now um, when the lockdown came my son should have been on the road I should have been on the road uh, we have I have a studio in the gardens and the company who did my current album no control which is just had rave reviews that I did with my son uh, they took up the option so all of a sudden we're both grounded I said Richard let's write the album so during lockdown we have written 14 songs i have assembled a illustrated coffee set coffee table size um lyric book similar to my poetry book it's now at the printers i've worked on my movie script which is coming next and we will be delivering that mid-july um and now i'm starting on my next idea for a book if i can't create I'm dead in the water. I have to communicate, create, and entertain. Th then I'm happy. Then my cycle is complete. So I've been using my time. I've been doing bass lines on the internet, you know, Susie Quarter's bass line. Everybody's loving those. I've been doing Susie Sunday specials where I play a song at the piano. So I'm trying, I tried in my own way to lift the mood as the entertainer that I am. I'm not getting paid for it. There's a lot of work that goes in, you know, but mm -hmm. the, the comments from people, They've gone, oh, we wait for this every morning. I say, oh, that's nice. Thank God, you know, I can do something to alleviate it, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And that's got to be hard as an artist being stuck in this place where your creativity is continuing to go. But it drives. Well, that that's why I have to be creative and do something. I actually put on Facebook not that long ago. I said, "Oh my God, okay, I don't know what I don't have a a schedule in my hand. I don't know when the flight is. I don't know where the hotel is. I don't know where Tom Soundcheck is. My bag is packed and I'm rolling it. Who am I?" And they all said, "Don't worry." <laughs> Who am I? And, you know, and a lot of the musicians they answered, "Oh God, we're there with you." You don't know what to do with yourself. If somebody doesn't tell me what time I need to be somewhere, I don't know what to do because my whole life has been around schedule. There's yeah. always, always something is slotted in, you know. Yeah. Even so you have to sort of. You're my last one now, you know. So then I've crossed it out, and then that's the, then then it's my time. Yeah. It's movie time. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. When you look back on all of the incredible things you've done thus far, because clearly there is a whole lot of other great stuff coming, just waiting for quarantine to be lifted. Is there, a, and I know it's impossible to do this, but is, is there a particular moment for someone who maybe isn't familiar with all the things you've done that stands out as the most pivotal moment in your career? Oh, God. Oh, that's hard. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, happy days, you know, watch that. Watch any of the early shows that I did, you know, when, when you're playing in front of thousands and it's just you. I mean, the one that just came to mind was when I turned 50, I was doing the biggest outdoor gig in Germany and I played to 22,000 people on my wow. 50th day and they brought a cake out. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. If you're going to turn 50, <laughs> right? <laughs> do it that way. There's been some pretty wonderful moments in my life. A lot of them are in the documentary. Um, the best place to start is with my with my hit. Start there. Yeah. Oh, and then you mm -hmm. get to know about me and you educate yourself. And I would say don't watch Happy Days till you're further down the line of who I am. And then yeah. you can, I slotted into that and how that became yeah. part of me. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm Dr. Quattro now, you know. I know, from Cambridge, no less. <laughs> you know, I didn't graduate high school, which I think it's it's me going. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic, right? I mean, it's truly so much of what you've done is what so many people dream to do, but don't have the strength to listen to that small voice inside of them telling them that, yes, you are as special as you believe you are, as, as you know you are. And That's just fantastic. to hear that story and hear how you've done that, I think is so inspirational for people to go, you know what? I can do this. If she can do this from Detroit and move this to is what the girls say. Herself, This is what right. all the girls say. I gave them permission yeah. to be yeah. something different. Right. How great is that? Oh, my God. You can be anything you want to be. Mm -hmm. I'm all for that. Stay true to yourself. It's all your. There's a song on my, on my current album, that everybody agrees. Everything I've written, I've written so many songs. If you if you say to me which song is you, you'll have to play that. Um, it's me, and it's called No Soul, No Control. It's the first track on the album, and it there's a video of it on YouTube. Awesome. The word the words are completely me. I've never written a more true song, and it's what we're discussing. That's what made me think of it. You know. Awesome. Love it. All you got, all you got is you at the end of the day. You got you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it. That's true. I think I'm talking to you. Because <laughs> <Yeah. we're... laughs> I'm watching your, your face. I'm a real good people reader. So I'm watching you. <laughs> and, and, and you're relating to that big time. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. For sure. No, it's a, it's, amazing All, and it's so true it's it's so true and people people are scared of themselves i think there, a lot of yeah, they are there, there's one line in the movie whenever i hear it i go it, it confuses me one of my sisters says it and and you'll get this she says um oh yeah oh yeah susie's always going she won't let anybody <laughs> stop her not her family not her husband and i'm thinking as soon as she said it i went why would right? <laughs> why would anybody want to stop anybody? I don't get where that comes from. Do you? No. It's why true. would you? 
Why would you stop somebody? Why, why stop somebody on their path? What harm am I doing to anybody else following my road? Yeah. Well, yeah. I thought that that was something you were, you know, very forthright in the documentary and really allowed people to see kind of the reality of, of the struggles of coming from a large family right. and your path right. being different. And it was really wonderful for you to allow yourself to be that vulnerable, even for your family to participate as well. And I think that's a huge benefit that will come from viewers too, because we all grow up in situations where we're like, oh, or, man. or we do. And, and I, I had editing scissors, you know, I, I had editing scissors. And I, <laughs> well, you have to, it's my right. life. Right. And I said, I said to the director, because I'm, if nothing, I'm honest. I am. I'm a, I'm a no bullshit girl. I'm an honest girl. Straightforward. You might not always like what I say, but at least you get the truth from me. I won't bullshit you. But saying that everybody has their own truth, sure. And I said to him, I won't, I won't use the editing scissors for anything that is important and it's true and it's somebody's opinion. So... Maybe somebody says something I'm uncomfortable. If that's how they feel, that stays in. And I kept true to that. And this is what people are reacting to. Sure, it's painful. It's hard to watch. But I gave them the chance to speak. I didn't write the questions. I was nowhere near the interviews. And they spoke their mind. So why shouldn't that be in there? This is how they feel. And that's okay. I mean, it's hurtful, sure. But, but why shouldn't they be able to say... They don't have to say, oh, she's wonderful. They're never going to say that. No, because Debbie Harry's going to say that. I was going to say Debbie Harry's <laughs> bad. Yeah. And, and, and I'm beautiful. Don't forget that one. Right. <laughs> I keep saying that. I don't care if she was lying. She's saying <laughs> I'm pretty sure Debbie probably wouldn't lie either about something like that. <laughs> I've got a little um, email from her because we are friends. And I printed it out and I framed it. It's up here on my board. She, she wrote to me, whether you know it or not, you are a true genius in every sense of the word. I just went, see, that gets me misty-eyed. What a lovely thing to say. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Wow. And I think it also says something, too, about your personality, about just who you are, that all these people are not only willing to say this stuff for you, but are so you know, we're involved at the film, agreed to sit down with everybody like that. That takes some time and that they are all willing to do it for you, I think, says a lot about who you are and how important your work has has been to it, them. It's humbling. It is humbling. When I watch it on the screen, I just go. <laughs> I snuck in. And I'm going to have to go in a minute. When I, yeah. I snuck the first um, premiere that I did here in London at Regent Street, it was sold out. And I was so nervous because I hadn't seen it on the big screen and I hadn't seen it with an audience and no audience is predictable, you know, and going, Oh my God. But they reacted in every part like I thought they would, but I was standing on the side and I was just in tears the whole time. Sometimes happy, sometimes sad. It just really blew me away. I kept going, I did that. I did all that. I was, I did. Oh my, he said, <laughs> top of the documentary, Susie just released a new album called The Devil in Me. For more information to buy copies of the record, you can check out her website, suzyquattro.com. You can follow us on all the various socials. You can check out our website at rockandrollgradschool.com for more grad school content. And please leave us a review on iTunes. We're tired of asking our family members to do so. Today's show was produced by myself and Heidi Hedquist. Our reluctant executive producers are John Sophie and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Richard Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. Our graphic designer is Samantha Mastone. This one's for Philippe. Thank you, good night, and may all your favorite bands stay together. Wait, wait, wait.